This is the last work by César Manrique, a visionary artist who died in 1992, enamoured of ecology and madly in love with the landscapes of his island. It is a legacy of spikes and black stone, perfectly in keeping with the singular aesthetic of his work. In this atmosphere, redolent of a western, our Canarian green team is going to reveal the secrets of this extraordinary garden. Meet Eduardo Manrique, the artist's nephew. Antonio Martin Santos, the gardener. Chana Pereira Brito, a farmer. Domingo Concepcion, a biologist. Alfredo Diaz Gutierrez, curator of the Cesar Manrique Foundation. And finally, the spirit of Cesar Manrique himself. An artist's final work is always the most important. It's an explosion of creativity. César Manrique's work is the definition of the island's conceptual elements, its singularity, its natural landscape, and its cultural landscape. He condensed all those elements and reinterpreted them in a modern way through spatial and artistic intervention. And there's no doubt about it, they're all concentrated here. I would say that this relates to what he experienced as a child. He was always saying that. He told of how he would run along Famara Beach, which is a beautiful beach situated in the north of Lanzarote. He told of how he ran like a wild child when he was little. He soaked up all of this nature, this landscape, characterized by telluric and volcanic elements. It's an arid landscape, a windswept, sun-kissed landscape. That's why the link that César Manrique established between nature and art is so crucial. It forms the basis of this work. This botanical collection planted in ash constitutes the perfect balance between the natural and the cultivated. The landscape is startling from the moment you arrive, greeted by an imposing eight meter high green metal cactus, designed by César Manrique. Behind the wrought iron cactus gate, the artist first built a maze Mazes have been a common motif in landscape architecture since the start of the 15th century. Here, its purpose is to prolong the suspense, leaving visitors to guess what the garden is like from the outside. Then a double staircase leads you in. The garden itself is like a maze as well. There's something new to discover everywhere you go. It's labyrinthine and theatrical. The paths are winding. You go around in circles only to end up in the same place as before. Then you get lost again. He liked the organic nature of the space. It's not a linear space, and he identified with that perfectly because he was a very dynamic character. He was someone whose genius made him stand out from the crowd. His designs are so original that visitors would leave with his artistic creations imprinted on their memory, creations to which they are unaccustomed and which do not exist anywhere else. Rounded, curvaceous, friendly, serene forms appear in almost all the works he created here. The landscape's like that as well. It has these organic forms. These are the forms Manrique applies to his architecture. And you find a lot of these elements in the architecture of Lanzarote. That organic quality, it's very prevalent.
In order to explore this collection of 4,000 plants set in a stone amphitheatre covering 24 hectares of land, you have to follow the winding paths. In terms of shape, foliage, size and colour, the cacti growing here are incredibly diverse, as are their origins, America, Africa and even Oceania. His place is home to over 600 species, which the artist patiently acclimatised. His choice of cacti, he called on Isanislao, a renowned local botanist, to guide him. But each element has been touched by the hand of the artist. He had a real attention to detail. The cacti are arranged like the brush strokes on a canvas. On this living canvas, the artist attended to everything from the layout of the pathways to the wrought iron lamps, not forgetting the goldfish ponds and the astonishing sculptures which embody César Manrique's mischievous spirit. This universe is now the domain of head gardener Antonio Martin Santos. I really like cacti for their elegant appearance. I also like them because they're intelligent plants. They're plants which seem to have anticipated things. Cacti shed their leaves and replace them with thorns so that they could absorb water. There are some species which, as well as reproducing sexually, also reproduce asexually. When a herd of cattle passes, they attach themselves to the animals and get transported. They can travel up to 400 kilometers like that without falling off. Then they sow themselves in the ground and produce new plants. Isn't that an incredible survival tactic? This is one of the garden's stranger plants. It's the only hybrid in the cactus garden. It's a cross between Echinopsis thelagona and Echinopsis kermesina. What makes it so unusual is this tubular flower. It's a wonderful purple color. And the inside of the tube is a yellowy green. Here we have another remarkable plant, Echinopsis tacoquirensis. It has spectacular flowers. These flowers are pollinated by our friends, the bees. Here's an amusing anecdote. We made an amazing discovery whilst studying this unusual plant in this garden. We observed mice climbing onto the thorns to reach the fruit and eat the seeds. Now that allowed the seeds to be scattered, meaning that the plant could grow in other parts of the garden. Cacti are known first and foremost for their limited use of water but their flowers are characterised by a riot of bright colours. They are gaudy and loud. Some only flower at night, others only flower for a few hours, and some only flower in winter. The best way to optimize the space was to plant a series of cacti, not just from this region, but from around the world. They symbolize Manrique's open-minded spirit, because the artist didn't just think about Lanzarote. He had a, a global vision for his art. This way he could combine the traditions of local agriculture with modernity. He brought the two things together, tradition, and modernity. With its high stone walls, this unique place is a circular metaphor for the island and its craters. It is an ostensibly inhospitable landscape that César Manrique made attractive, drawing inspiration from Lanzarote's remarkable landscape. It is round, like these strange stone circles resembling Zen gardens that are built in the middle of the desert by island farmers as a structure upon which to grow their vines. It was thanks to these farming methods that Manrique managed to acclimatize his collection of cacti. Accompanied by biologist Domingo Concepcion, 
we are going to explore his unique approach to conjuring up green from black. In this landscape, you have the black of a recent volcanic eruption contrasting with the green of the plants, even though it seems impossible for any plants to grow here. The reason they do can be explained by the fact that the volcanic ejections fell on pre-existing fertile land. Farmers noticed that, despite the ash, plants could continue to grow and even flourish. When the volcanic ash landed here, they observed that their vines and other crops grew better and were more sustainable. That's how they discovered the main property of ash, which is to retain moisture. These dark-coloured specks, called lapilli, on which the cacti grow, have been like black gold for the farmers of Lanzarote for over 200 years. On display in the cactus garden is another farming tradition inspired by the island's landscapes, terrace cultivation. It is on one of these terraces that we find our biologist, Domingo Concepcion. Before becoming the cactus garden that we know today, this place was a refera, that is a local word for a quarry for volcanic grit. It's basically a cavity. On some of the slopes, there were abandoned crops on terraces. Monrique restored this quarry, this disused refera, in keeping with the environment. And that's how he came to design this system of staircases. This soil is very good for cacti. Here the soil comes from a lava flow, which we call malpais. For farmers, malpais is not good soil. It is no use for farming. The only things that grow here are prickly pears. So it is perfect soil for cacti, just like any desert area around the world, in Arizona, Mexico, or elsewhere. This plant is the star of the garden. It is a Euphorbia candelabrum. It originates from Somalia. It's very important because it was the first plant to grow in the garden. When we planted it, it was about a metre tall. And now it's grown to be about eight metres tall. This plant is 27 years old. This plant is a succulent, and it gets its name from its resemblance to a candelabra. Euphorbias produce a different type of sap, a toxic latex, which is the plant's defence mechanism and just as effective as thorns. Cacti belong to a group of plants called succulents. These succulents are so-called because their stem, roots and foliage expand in such a way as to retain water. And that means they can survive without water in regions where other plants can't survive. All they need are light and sunshine. They can go without water for months. Here, we generally water them once a month or once every six weeks, depending on what sort of a winter we've had. And if it's been a wet winter, we water them less. If the opposite is true, we water them more. Cacti have a unique feature which distinguishes them from other plants. It's called an areola. These areolas are on the side of the plant. New stems, flowers and fruit sprout from them. This is the flower of the Matillo cactus. This plant's cultivated for its fruit. It has a tiny fruit which tastes like a blueberry. It's delicious. Cacti differ from euphorbias because what grows on euphorbias are not areolas, but a sort of extension of the epidermis. Mm -hmm. 
We are now in front of the Echinocactus grusonii, more commonly known as mother-in-law's cushion, golden barrel, or even queen's navel. Paradoxically, this plant is one of the most common cacti to be grown in gardens and parks around the world. But in its natural habitat, it's virtually extinct. It originates from central Mexico. I'm tidying up the Echinocactus grusonii, or mother-in-law's cushion. I'm removing the dried flowers. And this part of the flower has dried out already. As you can see, the, the lower part's a capsule, and inside it are the seeds. That's one of our tasks in the garden, to, to tidy up the plants. This is another very well-known species of cactus called Cephalocereus senilis. It comes from Mexico as well. The distinctive feature of this cactus is that it's completely covered with a sort of hairy fluff, which serves to protect the plant. They play the same role as the hairs on our head, so they protect us from the sun and everything else. Cesar was always fascinated by plants, especially cacti, which he spent a lot of time with. Cacti resemble sculptures more than any other plant. That characteristic was of aesthetic importance to him. Both the three-dimensional nature of cacti and their sculptural form. Each cactus has its own personality, which is shaped by its provenance. They could almost be said to have human traits. Working in this space, where nature is accentuated, was his pride and joy. He created an alternative landscape perfectly in keeping with the island, where he could pay homage to its plants. All his life, César Manrique tried to blend his creation with the island's landscapes. To better understand that intention, you just need to take the staircase leading up to the white windmill. This viewpoint offers visitors an unrestricted view not only over the garden, but also over the surrounding countryside, with cactus fields stretching as far as the eye can see. And not just any cacti. These are prickly pears, another symbol of Lanzarote, cultivated for the tiny parasite which nestles on their nopan leaves, the cochineal. This tiny insect, with its thick red blood, is collected because it makes an excellent bright crimson colourant. Cochineal is used for all sorts of things, in food colourings, in cosmetics, in dyes. For me, and for Lanzarote, this garden is a work of genius. César had the vision to place his cactus garden among the cactus fields. It's like an ode to the cactus. Even though he is no longer physically with us, the spirit of César and what he taught us is all around us. He left us a great legacy. The artist showed such devotion to his island that he built his own house on a lava field. This first work, built as a sort of manifesto, shows a fusion between the volcano and the architecture in a relationship of mutual respect. Raw materials, vernacular motifs, natural forms, 
cacti. He laid the foundations here for his cactus garden, which was to become his sole preoccupation. It seemed to him to be a magnificent place because it's full of spectacular volcanic forms which encapsulate the spirit of Lanzarote. You just need to look at the, the natural monoliths in the cactus garden to see the colors. The reds, the ochres, the blacks, all are there. They're in his works. The paintings he did were labeled as works of informalism and uh, materialism, uh, matter art. They're full of the textures, forms and colors that are so characteristic of Lanzarote. In this quarry, Cesar Manrique found a snapshot of everything that he felt represented Lanzarote. Where others saw a bleak landscape that had been burnt to cinder by volcanic eruptions, Cesar Manrique saw beauty. Looking at César Manrique's work makes you more aware of that beauty. You should view the cactus garden as a transformative space. It is the art which allows for that transformation. Behind this artistic approach lies something else. Manrique's fierce determination to make his homeland a model of sustainable development. When this painter and sculptor returned home from New York in 1966 at the age of 47, flushed with his success in America, mass tourism was starting to invade the island. Alarmed by the rate at which these big hotel complexes were going up, the artist realized he had to act fast. Through a series of spaces uniting nature and art, he invented a different form of tourism, and the whole of Lanzarote became his life-sized canvas. César's involvement beyond the art world was key. He spoke out against the new developments back in the day. As far as I'm concerned, he was the best spokesperson in the history of Lanzarote. He put up an extraordinary fight. He fought body and soul against property speculation. It shows the close connection he felt with the island. The places created by Manrique are very beautiful, but they're also a testimony to his ethical commitment. We must do all we can to protect these places. We must preserve their singularity. We have a right to enjoy them and make the most of them, but we must understand them too. Cesar Manrique, art and life are inseparable. The purpose of art is not just to give aesthetic pleasure. It's a, it's a manifestation of life itself. You shouldn't just look at art from afar. It should be integral to your life. In 1993, a year after César Manrique's death, the island of Lanzarote was classified as a UNESCO biosphere reserve. This was a posthumous victory for the artist who, in the space of just 20 years, had turned his utopia into a reality. Cesar Manrique awakened a sensibility in Lanzarote, and he developed that sensibility. The islanders feel proud of what they have. It isn't big or little or anything like that. It's simply a pride for what they have. And what exists here can be combined, as Manrique has shown with this garden, with sensibilities from other parts of the world. That is the magic of art. Mm-hmm.